speaking in tongues is that ability by the Spirit to communicate unto God in a language that you do not understand, you do not know, and you have not studied. This phenomena took place in the early church, the day when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church. In the second chapter of the book of Acts, we read that as the disciples were all assembled together there in the upper room, that suddenly there came a sound from heaven like as of a mighty rushing wind filling the house where they were seated. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them the ability or prompted their speech. And at that time, because it was the Feast of Pentecost, there were Jews who had assembled to Jerusalem for this feast from all over the then known world. And when they heard them speaking in their own dialects, knowing that they were all Galileans, they marveled, wondered what was going on, because in the dialects of the Mesopotamians, the various areas from where they had come, they were each of them hearing in their own language, these Galileans, praising God and magnifying, glorifying God. It was a very powerful evidence of the supernatural power of God that was being bestowed upon the early church when God poured out his Holy Spirit upon the church. In the book of Acts, chapter 10, when Peter went to, I mean, Philip went to Samaria and preach Christ unto them, and Peter and John later came in order that they might lay hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit, we found that as Peter and John laid their hands upon them, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now there is no mention there that they spoke in tongues. However, there is perhaps an obvious inference to it because Simon the sorcerer when he saw how that by the laying on of hands the Holy Spirit was given he sought to buy this power that whoever he laid his hands on they would receive the Holy Spirit also there must have been some type of accompanying phenomena to Peter and John's laying their hands on the people that caused Simon to desire this power. In other words, there must have been some kind of evidence or phenomena that was taking place. Else, if it were just a quiet receiving and filling of the Spirit, um, there wouldn't be any uh, request on the part of Simon to to have this kind of power. But we do know that later on when Peter went to the house of Cornelius in Caesarea and he was ministering to the Gentiles as he was speaking unto them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they all began to speak again in other tongues. That is, tongues other than was their own natural learned language. And then again in the 19th chapter of the book of Acts, we find when Paul was come to the church in Ephesus that he observed that there was something lacking in their spiritual experience and he asked the question, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said they had not even heard of the Holy Spirit. 
And so Paul baptized them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began again to speak in other tongues. So in the early church, this phenomena of speaking in other tongues was a common phenomena. And surely the church in Corinth uh, practiced uh, this speaking in other tongues because Paul found it necessary to write to them to correct certain abuses that had sprung up with the use of this particular gift of the Spirit. And so he addresses himself to these abuses in the 12th chapter through the 14th chapter of his first epistle to the Corinthians. Now as Paul is writing to correct the abuse of the gift, in the 14th chapter he declares that if any man is speaking in an unknown tongue, he is not speaking unto man. Howbeit by the Spirit he is speaking divine mysteries or secrets unto God, seeing that no man understands him. Later on in the chapter, Paul speaks of the value of the gift in a person's own private devotional experience with God and suggest that there be very tight limitations upon its exercise in the gatherings or the meetings of the church. And if the gift was exercised in the church, it should be twice or at the most three times. That is within a service. And then after each exercise, there should be the gift of interpretation. And though Paul declared that he was thankful to God, that he spoke in tongues more than all of, they, all of them did, yet when he was in church, he did not seek to exercise this gift for he would rather speak five words in the language that the people understood than 10,000 words in a language they did not understand in order that they might be profited by what he was saying. So again, though Paul did exercise this gift very much in his own personally devotional life, he did not exercise this gift in the assembly of the believers. Later on, in that same chapter, Paul does restrict again the use of the gift of tongues in the public assembly if there be no one there with the gift of interpretation. And at that point, he tells the person that if there be no one with the gift of interpretation, that person, if he feels that he has an utterance in tongues, he should just do it to himself, speak unto himself and to God, but not to speak it aloud. Because if there is no one to interpret what he says, how is the person who is sitting over here not knowing what is going on or not understanding what the person is saying because it is in a, another language, how is he going to say, oh, yes, Lord, amen, Lord, at what the fellow is saying if he doesn't understand what he is saying? Now, Paul said, indeed, you do praise God well, but these people, other people, are not built up by it. They're not blessed or edified by it. So the very definite restrictions that were placed upon the exercise of this gift in the church, it would seem that it was not at all desirable in any public assembly and when the church was gathered together, its use was to be limited.
there are a lot of traditions that have developed with the exercise of the gift of tongues among the Pentecostal churches. Traditions that I feel are unscriptural. I think that we need again to emphasize the fact that the Bible must be our final authority for all of our faith. Whatever I believe, there must be a scriptural basis for it. My whole system of belief in God, in the Holy Spirit, in Jesus Christ, in salvation, in prophecy or whatever, is all based on God's Word. It is the base for my belief, but also for my practice. In other words, unless I can find a scriptural basis for what I am doing, then I would be better not to do it, uh, even if it be in the realm of the exercise of spiritual gifts or whatever. And in going to the Word of God as a final authority for faith and practice, it gives us a balance and it gives us a final word. You see, if I do not have an authority, then the result is confusion. You've got to have that final word of authority, something that you look at as the final word. It's there, that's the authority, that's where we base our faith, and that's where we base our practices, because this is what they did in the early church, so this is what we're doing now. This is what the Bible teaches, this is what we believe, and the Bible becomes our authority. If you do not accept the Bible as the final authority, then you open the door to so many, many uh, different concepts, ideas, revelations, or whatever, and uh, the result is confusion because there are people who have conflicting revelations and conflicting ideas. Today I had a young man in the office who has a lifelong family background in the Mormon church. He is seeking, in real honesty, I believe, to uh, come to a real understanding of the Word of God. But uh, whenever I would bring up a scripture uh, that uh, was not in harmony with the Mormon doctrine, he would immediately give you their explanation or their interpretation of that scripture whereby they, they change it so that it is not in conflict with Mormon doctrine. And they believe that an angel of the Lord appeared to this man, Joseph Smith, because Joseph Smith said the angel appeared to him. Later he said God himself appeared to him. And the angel directed him to this place where he was to dig up these golden tablets that were translated into the book of uh, the Mormon by the help of the Urim and the Thummim that he found with them. And with the help of the angel, he translated these golden tablets with this hieroglyphic type of writing upon it. And this angel gave him the um, understanding of how to establish God's latter-day church, the reinstituting of apostleship and apostle authority and so forth.
Now, if you accept the word of Joseph Smith that an angel appeared to him and told him these things, and you begin to accept them also as scriptural and as authoritative and as a basis for belief and practice, which, of course, the Mormons have, then in all honesty, the Mormons ought to be extremely interested in Pastor Buck, who uh, pastored up in Idaho, an Assembly of God church, who said that a few years ago the angel Gabriel and Cronai began to visit him uh, Sunday mornings at about 3 o'clock. And all of the things that Cronai and Gabriel revealed to him and showed to him about the church in these last days. Now, Gabriel and Cronai evidently weren't in cahoots with Moroni because what they told Pastor Buck does differ some from what uh, Moroni told Joseph Smith. Now, who can I believe? Pastor Buck is a very sincere and conscientious man, a reputable minister. He was until he died. And yet, you see, if I say, well, here's an angel from heaven that's revealed to uh, Joseph Smith, that Jesus was the brother of Lucifer, and that uh, he chose to come and redeem man, and Lucifer chose to be the advocate. And, and I begin to accept the things that Joseph Smith said the angel told him, but now here's another man says, but the angel told me this and it is not in keeping, then who am I going to believe? And you see, the result is confusion. Because here's another fellow says, an angel spoke to him. And another fellow says, well, an angel spoke to me. And so you can get a hundred people that will tell you that an angel visited them and spoke to them and told them different things. A heavenly messenger came and he revealed unto me. Now Paul the Apostle said concerning these heavenly messengers that number one, Satan himself was able to come as a minister of light in order to deceive. And that if an angel of heaven would come and teach you any other doctrine than that which you've already received here in the Word, let him be accursed. In John we are told, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits to see if they be of God. So if I just listen to what man says God has revealed to him or the angel of God has revealed to him, then I am opening the door because if I listen to one man who claims that the angel spoke to him, then really I should listen to every man who says that an angel spoke to him. Now, I don't know how many Elijahs we've had come visit us here at Calvary Chapel, <laughs> but there must have been at least a dozen who come and declare that they're Elijah the prophet. 
And they've got a message they want to share with the church here. And we say, but how do we know you're Elijah? And then they get all upset because we would dare to challenge the authenticity of their revelations. But if one man comes along and says he's Elijah and I listen to him, then I really ought to listen to every man who says he's Elijah, but I don't have time. So God has given to us, according to 2 Peter, everything that we need for life and for godliness. It's already given to us. It's here in the Word. And if any revelation comes that is contrary are contradictory to what is written here. It must be rejected. This has to be the final authority for our faith and for our practice. Now, there are churches, even Pentecostal churches, which have gotten into practices for which you cannot find a solid scriptural basis. You do not find that practice happening in the early church. I don't know anywhere in the New Testament where in the early church Paul or Peter or John went around slaying people in the Spirit. And yet it has become a very common practice in many of the Pentecostal churches. You say, but I had this glorious experience. Well, people have had all kinds of experiences. Don't forget, we were ministering to those kids that were on LSD. And you talk about some wild experiences. I mean, they had them. And if we then begin to take experience as the criteria of truth, then again, we will get into confusion because there are so many varied experiences that people can have. So, I am not interested in any doctrine or any practice in the church for which you cannot give a thoroughly solid, sound scriptural basis. And I don't care how exciting or, or whatever it might be, how, uh, unless there is a scriptural basis, I'm really not interested. Now, with the gift of speaking in tongues, there have been many Pentecostal traditions that have evolved around this particular gift and concepts concerning this spiritual gift which are not necessarily scriptural. And thus I reject. For instance, so many times in Pentecostal churches you will find someone standing up in the public service and speaking in an unknown tongue. And someone else will get up and interpret that unknown tongue. You say, well, isn't that scriptural? Yes. But if you ask them, well, what was that? So often they'll say, well, that was a message in tongues. 
And a message in tongues is not scriptural. God does not speak to you or God does not speak to the church in tongues. God speaks to you in the language that you understand. He doesn't speak to his church in tongues. I find no place in the Bible where God ever spoke to anybody in tongues except Belshazzar. But surely that wasn't to the church, that was to a wicked king. And there God spoke in, it really wasn't tongues, but it was a writing on the wall that he couldn't understand, and Daniel interpreted it. So many times when there is an utterance in tongues in a church service, the interpretation or the supposed interpretation comes off as, my little children, hearken unto my voice. I tell you, call upon me or praise my name or seek me or, or exhortation or, or edifying of the body and all. But I would suggest to you that that is not an interpretation of what was uttered in tongues. And I have been in Pentecostal churches longer than many of you have been alive. From the time I was a small boy, my parents went to a Pentecostal church. I grew up in one. But as a child, I always had a very inquiring mind, and there were many things that troubled me about the church that I was going to. Naturally, we felt that we were the most spiritual church in town because we spoke in tongues. That made us more spiritual than any other church. I was always sort of wondering why we weren't the largest church in town if we were the most spiritual. But then it was explained to me that the other churches were giving a people a much easier way to get to heaven and people were looking for the easy way. We were always promised pocket knives or other prizes if we would bring our friends to church. So I would talk my buddies into coming to church with me. But then it was always disastersville. Because we had a lady in the church, Mrs. Newman, who every Sunday morning would give one or two utterances in tongues. We called them messages in tongues in those days in church. But before she would give her message in tongues, she would begin a peculiar breathing pattern. <laughs> and you would begin to know, well, pretty soon, you know, it's going to come. She's going to stand up and she's going to you know, in this loud voice, come out with this utterance in tongues. And so it was sort of good because it kept you from being too shocked when that loud voice hit, you know, because it would be preceded by this, <gasps> you know. Of course, I was always fearful of blaspheming the Holy Spirit because I knew there was no forgiveness for that so whenever she would start that breathing pattern I was of course always bow my head and close my eyes because I didn't want to be guilty of doing anything wrong when the spirit was moving like that in the church I didn't know but what I might get wiped out <laughs> and I had a friend in school we were real close buddies Ed Hankey And Ed was big and Ed was tough. 
In fact, he later played defensive end for the San Francisco 49ers for many years. And Ed came to church with me one Sunday morning on my insistence and begging and everything else and promising that I'd go fishing with him afterwards. And as we were sitting in church, I heard Mrs. Newman go, <gasps> <laughs> and I bowed my head and I prayed, oh, please, God, don't speak to us in tongues today because I know Ed will never understand it, and I don't want to try to answer his questions after church. But I'm afraid God wasn't listening to my prayer, or Mrs. Newman wasn't listening to God. <laughs> because she came off with this utterance in tongues, and as I heard Ed giggling, I was praying, please, God, don't smite him dead. He doesn't understand what's going on. I was wishing that the preacher would never quit that sermon. I didn't want to face Ed after church because I knew the inevitable question was, what in the world was that? <laughs> and I knew the next day at school, everybody would know that I went to a church where, you know, people spoke in crazy languages. Now, having seen these things, having experienced these things as a child growing up, There were things that began to trouble me even at, a, at an early age because sometimes Mrs. Newman would give a very long utterance in tongues and there would be a very short interpretation. Sometimes she would give a very short utterance in tongues and there would be a very long interpretation. And sometimes in the utterance in tongues, there would be a repeated phrase, and, and she would repeat, and I would count how many times she said shandala. And then I would listen to see if there was the same repetition of the phrase in the interpretation. And sometimes maybe this phrase would be repeated 12 times in the utterance in tongues, but there wasn't any repeated phrases in the interpretation. And I wondered, how is it, you know, that you can give a short utterance and a long interpretation and you can have, you know, all of these repeated phrases, but yet you don't get any repeated phrases in the interpretation? And in my mind, as I was growing up, I was analyzing, challenging, and questioning these things. I never did question, really, the validity of the Holy Spirit or of God or of the work of Jesus Christ. But these did remain big questions in my mind. when I started reading the scriptures really on my own. Because you see, though I grew up in a Pentecostal church, I do not ever remember hearing one lesson on the subject of the gifts of the Spirit and their proper use. I had never been taught. It's just something that you knew was in the Bible and you grow up with it, but you were never taught taught scripturally what the Bible says. When I started to study on my own the Word of God, and when I came to 1 Corinthians 14, 1, and I read that he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto man, howbeit in the Spirit he is speaking divine secrets unto God, seeing that no man understands him, 
I began then to seriously challenge all of the experiences that I had observed growing up. Where the interpretation was addressed to the church as the my little children are hearken unto me or I the Lord am speaking to you or thus saith the Lord's would usually come at the end of everything. And, and they were addressed to the church as though God was speaking to the church through the interpretation of the tongue. And as I read concerning the gift of prophecy, but he who prophesieth speaketh unto the church to edification, to exhortation, to comfort, I realized that what I had observed all my life growing up was not the true exercise of the gift of tongues with interpretation, but was indeed the gift of tongues with prophecy. And I came to the realization that very few people really have the true gift of interpretation. For if the utterances in tongues are unto God, then it would follow that the interpretation of those utterances would also be addressed unto God. Again, Paul the Apostle said, If you speak in an unknown tongue and there is no interpreter present, how is the person sitting over here in the seat of the unlearned going to say yes and amen at what? You're speaking in tongues now, but there's no interpreter, and here's a guy over here who doesn't understand what you're saying. How is he going to say yes and amen to what? To the message that God is speaking to the church? No. How is he going to say yes and amen to your giving of thanks? You see, the giving of thanks is addressed to God. But how is he going to say yes and amen to your giving of thanks if he doesn't understand what you're saying? Indeed, you do praise God well. It's a good way to praise the Lord. But the church isn't edified by it if they don't understand the praises. Now, in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit was given unto the church, those that were gathered from all of these different areas and heard them speaking in their different dialects, they did not hear them preaching to them the gospel. They heard them magnifying and glorifying God. These people in other languages were praising God, magnifying God, glorifying God. Now, when the preaching started, it was in the language they all understood and in the language that Peter understood because he was preaching to them. Peter did not get up and preach in tongues to these people, but he preached in the common language that they all understood. So, the first thing that we need to clarify is that if I am exercising the gift of tongues, I am praising God or worshiping God or praying unto God, glorifying God in a language I don't know being directed, prompted, or guided by the Holy Spirit. Now, I can see a tremendous need for that in my own life. For I have feelings that are much deeper than my ability to express. Yesterday morning, as I watched the sunrise, we had that unusual cloud cover, but over around Saddleback area, south of that where the sun was coming up, it was sort of clear on the horizon, and so 
The first part of the sun as it began to rise was beneath that cloud cover and it turned that whole belly of the clouds just a fire red, absolutely gorgeous. In fact, it was such a phenomenal sunrise, I ran upstairs to wake up my wife to look at it. And then she was sleeping so soundly I thought better of it. And so I just <laughs> let her go. But it was one of those that, you know, well, you see something beautiful, you want to share it with someone you love, you know. And, and it was just one of those beautiful things, so spectacular that I just wanted to share it. And uh, if I tried to describe that sunrise to you, there, there's no way I could because I don't have that kind of a vocabulary. In fact, I don't think that they have even yet invented words that could really describe the, the glory, the beauty, the, the awe of that, of that whole sunrise. Now, I could feel it. I mean, man, you know, just the glory and all of the whole thing, I could feel it, but I could not express it adequately. Now, when I look at what God has done for me, what God has done in my life, when I think of what I was and what I think of what God has done in His love and in His grace for me, I feel such love for God and such appreciation to God. But I feel an inadequacy of expressing to God my feelings because there aren't words. I don't know the words. My vocabulary is too limited or I would say the English language is too limited. I oftentimes wish that I knew Greek better because there are a lot more words in Greek. Maybe if I could speak Greek, I wouldn't need the gifts so much. The Greek has a vocabulary of about 122,000 words, where the English vocabulary is only 26,000 words. So if you had a vocabulary that was four or five times greater than your present vocabulary, you might be able to, you know, express yourself a little better. But I find myself limited. There are many times when I have an idea in my mind that I can't even express because I don't know words to express it. There is something that I want to express, but there, there isn't any English word that I know of, and quite often I'll, put, I'll make up a word using a Latin or a Greek derivative, and I'll just make up a word. My wife's always getting after me for making up words. It's just because the English language doesn't have a word for that, and, and we need a word for that, and so I'll make up a word for that. Now, I look at my life and I realize that I'm a threefold type of a being. I live in a body, but I have a consciousness, a mind, and I am basically a spirit. Now, my spirit base is quite broad. Because that is the area where I meet God. That's the area where I fellowship with God. My mind area is very narrow, very restricted. Now here as I am seeking to communicate to God my feelings that come from my spirit, the love, the appreciation, and all that I have for God, as I try to express these things to God, the problem is that I've got to somehow compress them through this narrow little channel of my intellect. And that's where the problem comes in. As I am trying to adequately express to God those deep feelings of my spirit, I feel a great inadequacy. I can say thank you, I appreciate very much, I love you, I love you, I love you, but what can you say more than I love you? I mean, that's the strongest, but yet I can also say I love hot fudge sundaes and I love peanuts and, and all too, so that 
I'm not satisfied just saying to God, Oh God, I love you so much. Or God, I, you, you can't know how much I appreciate. But he does know. Uh, because that's the realm of the Spirit. But I try to express myself to God and I feel very limited as I seek to express my feelings in English. The limitations of the language and my intellect. Now, when I worship God with the Spirit, and Paul said, when I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, though my understanding is unfruitful. So when I begin to worship God with the Spirit, the value that I see in that is that I can bypass the narrow channel of my intellect and there can be just that open, broad base of expression. It doesn't have to narrow down now through my intellect to come to God. It's just a full, rich expression of my love and of my appreciation. As Paul said, indeed you do give thanks well. It's a good way to give thanks to God. Another limitation of my own intellect is that I do not always know what God is wanting to do. I don't always know what is the will of God. And when I am praying for others, what is God's will in this situation? Now, the Bible says if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So it's, it's great when I pray to know that I'm praying according to the will of God. And I can have great confidence in my prayer if I know I am praying according to the will of God. Now I think that praying against the will of God is just a, a waste of breath and a waste of time. Except God oftentimes uses that time of prayer to change me and bring me around to his will. But there is a problem in my prayer life of not always knowing how to pray as I ought. Now, Paul the Apostle in the 8th chapter of Romans tells us that when we have this problem, that the Holy Spirit will help our infirmities or that particular weakness. For the Holy Spirit will make intercession through us with groanings which cannot be articulated or uttered. They're just the groanings. Now, <laughs> one of our big problems, of course, is the intellect itself. You see, intellectually, it is extremely difficult for me to pray unto God or praise the Lord or, or communicate to God. It's diff or, uh, just difficult for me to do that in a language I don't understand. My intellect is insulted by it. Because I have to really lay my intellect aside and join with the Spirit in worshiping God this way. Now, because of my pride, my intellect often gets in my way. I would like to think that I'm fairly intelligent, though I know better. I'd like to think it anyhow. And to have to set my intellect aside in order to communicate to God in the most efficient manner does insult my intellect. And so I don't like to do it. It always takes an exercise of faith. You've got to exercise faith to utter sounds you don't understand. Not easy to utter sounds that you don't understand. 
and my mind is always playing with those sounds. As I listen to those sounds, my mind is seeking to analyze them, looking, as I did as a kid, for patterns, looking for, uh, you know, different aspects to it, looking for a word that I might understand. And then my mind says, that doesn't make sense. And then my mind says, you're just making that up yourself. You know, that's just gibberish. And, and my mind is constantly, it, it's insulted by it, and so it's constantly challenging it. I had an unusual experience where a man who was an Episcopalian asked me to pray for him that he might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And so as I prayed for him, he began speaking in tongues, but he began speaking the very language that I speak in tongues. Now, I don't know what language it is, but I recognize that he was speaking the same language. He was, he was speaking words, and I had never spoken in tongues in a public assembly, and, and, and I don't do it. I do it in my own devotions, and so I know that he wasn't just mimicking something that he heard me say. And my wife, of course, has heard me in my own devotions worshiping the Lord in tongues, and so she afterwards said, he was speaking the language that used to be. I said, I know it. Wasn't that wild, you know? And it was a very, a very fascinating experience for me. There have been many occasions where I have heard people speaking in tongues, and they were speaking in languages that I had a smattering of knowledge. I've heard people speaking in tongues in French, and I could understand uh, much of what they were saying because of a... Uh, Latin language background that I have. I've heard people speaking in tongues in Spanish. And I have friends who are missionaries who, when the natives received the gift of tongues, would speak in English. And that must have been a wild experience for them, too, you know. The fact that it is unknown, it is unknown to the person speaking. I believe that most generally it is a dialect that is perhaps spoken somewhere or maybe a language that is no longer spoken. I know of uh, cases where people have spoken in ancient dialects that are no longer uh, used commonly, but uh, a professor was there who had studied this ancient language and understood. We have a lady in the church here who consistently speaks in French whenever she speaks in tongues. And it is quite possible that a person in speaking in an unknown tongue may speak in a dialect that is not even used anywhere in the world. Now, some have objected to the gift, saying that Jesus never spoke in tongues. Well, how could he speak in an unknown tongue?
I believe that he understands every language and dialect that has ever been used. Because people pray to him in all kinds of languages and dialects, and, you know, he doesn't just understand you who pray in English. <laughs> but no matter where that person is around the world praying to God in different dialects, God understands them all. And thus, if you have that all knowledge, it would be possible, impossible to speak in an unknown tongue. Now, when he comes, then speaking in an unknown tongue will no longer even be necessary for us. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away with. We will no longer need this assist in communicating to God. Now, there is a, another vocal gift of the Spirit, which is the gift of prophecy, which we don't have time to get into tonight, but we'll move into it prophecy and the interpreting of tongues. And as we get into the subject of prophecy, we will consider that extremely difficult passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, which seems to be totally contradictory, where Paul says, for tongues are a sign to those that believe not. And prophecy is a sign to those that believe. And then in the very next verse, he said, And if the whole church be gathered together, and everyone is speaking in tongues, and a stranger comes in, will he not say that you're all a bunch of nuts? But if you are all prophesying, then the secrets of his heart will be revealed, and he'll go away and say, Man, the Word of God dwells in that place in truth because the secrets of his heart have been revealed. Now, it seems like those two verses totally contradict each other. Now, I am convinced that the Bible is not contradictory. And wherever there is an apparent contradiction, the problem is in our understanding, in our interpreting of the verse. So we will seek to bring you a fuller understanding of those two seemingly contradictory statements in our next lesson as we study the gift of prophecy and the gift of interpreting of tongues. Father, we thank you again for the privilege of being able to gather and open our hearts to you and to the Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Father, for every little assist that you give to us to help us in our walk and in our relating to you. And Lord, in that area of relating to you, we are thankful for that gift of speaking in an unknown tongue. And we thank you, Father, that by this exercise we can be built up and we can adequately praise you and thank you and declare unto you just how much we do love you and appreciate, Lord, all you are and all you've done. So, Lord, we just want to be open totally open to you. God, help us not to have any closed doors at all. May there be no off-limit signs that we would put up to you and, and say, Lord, you can do everything but. But give us that kind of faith and confidence in you where we can just freely, willingly, just lay ourselves out before you and say, God, anything you want, anything you want to do, Lord, have at it. Here I am. I need you. I want you. And I want whatever you have for me. Keep us ever, Lord, with that 
open attitude. Help us never to feel that we've arrived to the point where we need nothing more. God, keep us from that kind of pride. And may we just always realize how dependent we are upon you. And Lord, I want more of thee and thy fullness in my life. In Jesus' name, Father. Amen.